Hey, Grade A, we're starting a new topic and we're going to get into some biology, which is studying living things. So today we're going to talk about essentially living organisms, what living organisms have in common, and then also the structure of living things. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, the inquiry questions or things we're going to be looking at today is how can you tell if something is alive? What functions do organisms need to carry out to stay alive? And what are some of the structures that organisms have that allow them to carry out these functions? So we're going to start off by talking about what all living things have in common. And the first thing that all living things have in common is that they need energy. And, you know, different sources for different living things, right? Like, I mean, if you look at a plant, it's getting energy from the sun, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. If you're talking about that lion at the top, well, that's getting energy, of course, by eating other animals. Well, something like a herbivore, the giraffe, is getting energy from eating the plants. So it happens in different ways. You talk about a fungus, right? Like a mushroom. Well, it's getting energy from getting it from the thing it's growing on. So there's different ways of actually getting that energy. But at the end of the day, all living things need to get energy in some way. Number two, living things respond and adapt to their environment. Uh, and, and this is really kind of two parts of things adapt over time in order to better suit their environment, uh, but also just that they respond to things that happen in their environment and then uh, as a result change and do things in order to increase their rate or chance of survival. Uh, you know, a great example is actually plants. When you look at a plant, a plant actually over time throughout the day uh, moves as it actually like finds sunlight. I'll see if I can find a video and here's the video. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, everything responds and adapts to its environment in order to better increase its chances of survival. Survival. When we take a look at the giraffe over a large amount of time, giraffes have adapted to have a longer and longer neck in order for them to reach uh, leaves. And what's interesting is actually that the plants that giraffes feed on have actually gotten higher and higher up in terms of where the leaves are. And they've gotten thornier and thornier. And then as a result, um, giraffes have got these like crazy tongues that are super rough and long to be able to move around and get stuff from between the thorns. And it's basically an arms race between the plant who's trying to survive and not get eaten and the giraffe who's trying to eat some delicious plants. But both of them are responding and adapting to their environment. All living things reproduce, otherwise they would no longer be in existence. Yes, so everything that's living has offspring uh, that is made. And reproduction can be either sexual, which means that it involves two individuals, or asexual, which means it involves only one individual to make that offspring. Uh, but both you know, ways make offspring. And you're going to learn more about this in grade nine. This is kind of a neat video, and hopefully you can see this well with where it's at. This is actually just the cell division of the bacteria over 10 hours. Uh, and this is actually going through a process of what's called binary fission. Um, it's just crazy how fast it reproduces. And this is an asexual reproduction method. So you see these bacteria splitting over and over and over again to make more copies of themselves. Another thing that all living things have in common is they all grow, right? So uh, you got like that plant diagram of seed to seedling to small plant to tree. Uh, and then of course, you know, this beautiful picture of the person growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But all living things grow over time. All living things produce waste. Uh, so the cows are there and methane gas. We actually did a Science Vertical Friday around that, right? The burping cows making methane, uh, which contributes to climate change. So that's one example of waste. Of course, there's the boop and the bee, which is what we're seeing right here. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, and then, you know, carbon dioxide is waste for us as well that we're breathing out all the time. So we actually produce a lot of different varieties of waste. Yay for us! So in order to carry out these functions, animals and plants need different structures. And one part of the curriculum is actually kind of comparing and contrasting how plants and animals end up having different structures in order to um, get what they need. So what are some specialized structures that you have that help you to obtain energy? Mm. You have, for example, a mouth and teeth and a stomach. 
and stomach acid and your intestines and you know a little kind of like surface area dips the uh, pili in your intestine i think it's called uh, all sorts of stuff that you have that help you to get energy so let's talk about plants first plants make their own food using energy from the sun so chloroplasts capture sunlight for photosynthesis to produce sugars to be used as food uh, you actually talked a lot about this in grade seven in your unit of plants for food and fiber, and you'll learn all about photosynthesis, but essentially what happens is sunlight comes in and uh, most of the chloroplasts are in cells in the leaf, actually in one of the higher up layers called the palisade tissue cells, but that's too in depth. Uh, but essentially what happens is that sunlight gets captured by chloroplasts in the cells, and then from there, we end up actually getting uh, sugar being produced as well as oxygen um, and carbon dioxide and water is needed for that to happen. Carbon dioxide comes in through the leaves and water, of course, comes from the roots. And then as a result, it makes its own sugar. So that's how plants actually end up, you know, uh, suiting their energy needs is they make sugar by using energy from the sun and the specialized structure they have for that is the chloroplasts in their cells so hooray for plants uh, most animals for example instead take in their energy by eating food and actually i I don't even know why the word most is there. Animals get their energy by eating food. And they have different structures to help with that. Like for example, the legs. They need legs in order to catch their food, for example. Um, and of course, this would be different for other animals, but these are just examples. Elephants have their amazing trunk, which allows them to eat. Uh, so that's quite incredible. And man, those trunks are dexterous. Good for elephants. Giraffes have their amazing long neck. And like I said, they're super tough and crazy tongue. Oh man, we really should just watch a video of a giraffe eating. Uh, and then we have claws in order to catch and tear apart their prey. And of course, teeth. Teeth are so important. Oh, those are scary teeth. I guess that's a shark of some kind. Ugh. Okay, so those are some examples of structures that animals may have in order to enable them to get energy. Organisms also have structures that help them respond and adapt to their environment. So some examples of this, plants grow leaves where they can reach sunlight and they actually have mechanisms for this that have to do with these neat chemical transmitters they have. Um, so actually different leaves will grow uh, at different heights depending on the plant and what their strategy is for actually getting sunlight and energy, which is interesting. This is like a huge thing in the rainforest where they have amazing mechanisms in order to get sunlight. Uh, some plants actually climb up other plants in order to get uh, to the sun because things are so dense, but there are mechanisms for that. And again, you saw the video of things moving towards the sunlight throughout the day, and that's part of it as well. Uh, so that's an example of plants, animals. Well, plants have different mechanisms as well. Um, even uh, things like uh, the fact that they'll straighten out if they're sideways and stuff and all different ways in order to make sure that they are uh, able to better adapt to their environment. It's quite neat. Um, animals, owls, for example, have eyes adapted for seeing in the dark. So there's the owl eyes, super large in order to see what they can see in very low light conditions. Bat ears, right? Bats have massive ears compared to their body and that's because they use echolocation in order to find their prey. So they need those massive ears in order to make sure that they can actually tell where things are. Snow hares adapt by changing their fur color, right? So they can actually better uh, survive with white. So they're camouflaged in. So all of these are ways that things respond and adapt to their environment. Here's an example of an adaptation. If you look at these four birds, which one do you think is best suited for eating larger seeds? Hmm, I would say number one, because it's got a larger beak. So it probably is better able to crush those large seeds. Uh, now let's talk about waste. Plants, for example, have structures to release their waste, and that's actually done with the stoma, or stomata plural, um, and when I talk about stomata, that is this opening on the bottom side of leaves that allows carbon dioxide uh, to come in and then oxygen, their waste, right? Like 
kind of funny that that's the waste for plants, but plants, their waste is oxygen. They release that to the atmosphere. So that's how they get rid of their waste is by having these openings at the bottom side of their leaves, the stomata that end up releasing oxygen to their environment as an example. Now you don't have to know these examples. Yeah. You just have to recognize that plants and animals have different structures uh, in order to suit their needs. Animal waste, I mean, we've got different ways. We breathe out carbon dioxide, um, so that's an example. We produce urine, so that's how we get rid of our liquid waste. A lot of nitrogen wastes in there, uh, right, in our urea, which is the main chemical compound in urine. Feces, that's where our solid waste gets released, right? Everybody poops, everybody poops. And so we all release feces coming out of our digestive tract, so that's another way that we uh, release waste as well. Okay, so hopefully through that you recognize that plants and animals have different structures that they use to suit their needs. Now, in terms of levels of organization, this is just a straight up, you got to memorize this and know it, but there's different levels of organization from more simple to more complex that have specific names, specific titles. So we start off with the cell. The cell is the smallest functional unit of life. Now, if we have a bunch of cells grouped together that are similar, we call that a tissue. If we have a bunch of tissues grouped together that perform a simple function, we call that an organ, like the heart, whose function is to pump blood. And then if we have a bunch of different organs and tissues grouped together to perform a larger, more complex function, we call that a system. Like for example, the circulatory system that contains both the heart, but also the arteries and the veins and the capillaries. All the different blood vessels are included in that. And that would be a system. And then if we go Past that, we have, of course, the full organism, the full living thing. So let's talk more about these individual parts. Cells are our basic unit of life. It's the smallest functional unit of life. And all living things are made up of cells. Okay, so everything that's living has cells. Now, the cells will be different. They'll have variations on what they have inside of them and how they look and so on. But they have a lot in common. And we're going to learn more about cells. In fact, we are going to study a bunch of these different organelles, uh, which is what we call the bits inside of a cell that perform specific functions like the nucleus and the mitochondria and the Golgi apparatus and smooth endoplasmic reticulum and all these different things. We're going to learn about them later on. But um, all living things are made up of these cells. Smallest things be considered alive. And organisms can be multicellular or single-celled, unicellular. So if you look at a bacteria, I mean, that's a unicellular organism, right? One bacteria is one cell. So kind of neat there. If I get a bunch of cells together that are similar and perform a similar function, I call that a tissue. Uh, some examples, connective tissues, skeletal and smooth muscle tissues, nervous tissues. On this diagram, I've got some other ones like epithelial tissue in your skin, skeletal muscle tissue, connective tissue in there, um, smooth muscle down here in your intestines, all sorts of different types of tissues. When I put a bunch of different tissues together and performs a simple function, well then I call that a organ. So a stomach would be an organ, a heart would be an organ, a liver, a lung. Um, I actually should mention that in, in plants, leaves are actually an organ. So a leaf would be an organ in the plant. Okay, and then if I take a look at a full-on system, that's when I have a bunch of organs and tissues working together to perform a bodily function. So examples, digestive, nervous, nervous circulatory systems, these are all systems. <clears throat> so important for you to know this in order from smallest to largest. So you straight up got to memorize. Here it goes, cell, tissue, organ, system, organism. Okay, that's something that you got to memorize and you got to know. Guaranteed it's going to be on quizzes and tests and everything else. So here's a nice little analogy for this. If I have one Lego block, well, hey, that's a cell. Should have moved that before. That's a cell. Okay, if I get a bunch of Lego blocks together, yeah, uh, and normally they're similar, but that would be like a tissue. So here's, here's a tissue, a bunch of blocks together. And then if I get uh, a bunch of different tissues together to come up with one kind of function. So this is a house to hold the Lego peoples. Well, then that's an organ. And then finally, if I get a bunch of organs together to make a big old Lego metropolis, well, then that would be like a system. Okay, so I've got cell, 
tissue, um, organ, and then system. And hey, if I had a bunch of these different systems, these uh, Lego cities together in a big old world, well then maybe that would be my organism. So that's your nice analogy for that. Okay, so what did you learn today? Well, you learned the characteristics that all living things have in common. Make sure that you know that list. You learned that plants and animals have different structures in order to satisfy their needs, in order to get what they need. And then you also learned about the uh, structure of organization and living things. So cell, tissue, organ system, and then organism. That's it for today. Have a good rest of your day.